They're the best in the fleet. The best in the country. The best in the world. But they weren't always. At the height of the Vietnam War, the U.S. Navy was losing the battle in the sky. From the ashes of defeat rose the greatest fighter school on Earth and a new breed of pilot. This is the real story of Top Gun. April 9th, 1965. A hundred years to the day after the end of the war between the states, America is about to plunge into another civil war, halfway around the world. On the Gulf of Tonkin, in the South China Sea, the USS Ranger launches six of the Navy's latest fighting machines, the F-4 Phantom. Their mission? To protect the carrier from enemy aircraft. But today, the Phantoms are flying in harm's way. In 1965, few Americans can find Tonkin Gulf on a map. But every day they're learning more about a Southeast Asian nation called Vietnam. In March 1965, the first GIs wait ashore. Most expect in one year their tour will be over, and so will the war. Seven years from now, the fighting will rage on. But in the spring of 65, the U.S. has never lost a war. And the skies of Vietnam belong to America. Or so it seems. On April 9th, a surprise is waiting for the Navy fighters. North Vietnamese MiG. The Phantoms are built for long-range combat. But the MiGs close in for a dogfight. The Phantoms try to pull away. But the MiGs are more maneuverable. After a series of hard turns, one of the Phantoms has lost precious airspeed. It can't shake its pursuer. America was losing the war in the air because one machine was being sent to do a job it wasn't built for. I present to you the President of the United States. <laughs> These planes, which help protect the security of the United States and the dozens of countries which are associated and allied with us, all around the world, which would not be free if it were not for the power and the determination of the United States. The F-4 Phantom was introduced at the height of the Cold War, amid high hopes. It was so impressive that both the Navy and the Air Force ordered the plane. The entire focus of both the Navy and the Air Force was uh, in the late 50s and early 60s was uh, against the Soviet bomber threat. We thought that Soviets were going to come over and bomb Los Angeles, and they built the F-4 to counter that threat. By 1964 is the first time I uh, got to fly the Phantom, 
and Phantom would do things no other airplane I had ever flown could do, you know. I had one up to Mach 2.38. At that point in time, everything just starts heating up and the warning lights come on. You know, if you get frictional heating on it, and the airplane just, uh, she's reached her, she's reached her heat limits. The airplane would continue to go, but it'd start coming apart. I'd never flown anything that fast. Among the Navy's fighter jocks, the Phantom quickly gained a reputation as a hot airplane with power to spare. It could reach 1,600 miles per hour and soar to 66,000 feet, both unprecedented in a fighter. There was only one thing the Navy's version lacked, a gun. Historically, in any turning fight, you need a gun. The gun is fearsome, particularly the guns that were available that uh, there were in the Air Force airplane. It had a Gatling gun, 6,000 rounds a minute Gatling gun, who put the fear of God in anybody you're shooting at with. We never had them designed in the airplane. Instead, the Navy ordered the Phantom equipped with eight air-to-air -air missiles, four long-range radar-guided Sparrows, and four of the new heat-seeking sidewinders that honed in on the enemy's white-hot engines. The weapons were so sophisticated, the Phantom required a second crewman to fire them, called a Radar Intercept Officer, or RIO. This was revolutionary. A phantom pilot could hit a target he couldn't even see. On June 17, 1965, six F-4 phantoms take off from the USS Midway to escort a wave of bombers over North Vietnam. In the lead are Lou Page and his RIO, J.C. Smith. As the bombers finish their run and head for home, Smith spots MiGs on his radar. I picked the contacts up at about 38 miles. The MiGs aren't close enough to fire. The Phantoms are. Smith radios his wingman. Jack Batson, call sign Batman. And I said, call Judy, which is lockup. I said, call Judy on the near target, the near target. We locked on to the far target. There were two blips on my scope, two blips, and they were a mile apart. I said, shoot, shoot, shoot. Lou squeezed down. Batman squeezed down. It, whew, I saw the sparrow fly right by our wingtip. We had, boom, two airplanes down. That night, the Navy celebrated its first kills of the Vietnam War. The age of push-button warfare had arrived, and the dogfight seemed a thing of the past. After every major air war, the engineers have moved in and said, that's really a silly way to fight a war, airplane against airplane. Let's devise a weapon that obviate the necessity for one airplane to go fly another airplane. And after the Korean War, we got rid of that, said, we've got Sparrow missiles, we've got new weapon systems, we'll never dogfight again. The day of the dogfight was over. It's all going to be long range, you know, the Sparrow missiles and, and all that stuff. And uh, if I'm not 
mistake, and that's one reason that a gun was never put in the uh, Phantom, because, hey, the day of the gunfight's over, and it's all going to be standoff uh, shoots and all that stuff. The prophets who foretold the death of the dogfight were about to be proven terribly wrong. In the early days of the Vietnam War, the battle in the air suddenly took a turn for the worse. In the case of mistaken identity, two Navy pilots were shot down by their own side. In the wake of the tragedy, the Pentagon ordered pilots to identify targets with the naked eye before shooting. That changed everything. Along comes Vietnam and we're trying to fight MiG-17s instead of Soviet bombers and the F-4 was thrown into a role that was never envisioned for it. The F-4 Sparrow missile was designed to be fired from at least one mile. But now it was being fired much closer. In late 1967, Phantoms launched 55 Sparrows without a single hit. Worse, the Phantom's smoky engines made it easy to spot. The most powerful machine in the air had suddenly become fair game for the cheap, agile little MiG. The Navy's kill ratio plummeted to a dismal two to one. It was still shooting down twice as many planes as the enemy was. But every time one Phantom went down, two crewmen were killed or captured. In the history of American aviation, never had so many sacrificed so much for so little. 1967, I was out there on Enterprise, and uh, to put a real perspective, something that I think everybody will understand, is we lost 17 guys in 11 days. The problem was devastatingly simple. Navy pilots were forced to fight at close quarters, but the Phantom was built for fighting at long range. You have to get in close with them. You have to identify them. Therefore, you're in a wrestling match with them and you better be trained in air combat maneuver. The ability to dogfight the airplane, just like everybody's done in every major engagement with airplanes since World War I. And we hadn't been trained to do that. When World War I began, both sides were using the biplane simply for spying. Enemy pilots would pass each other without exchanging more than a wave. But on October 5th, 1914, that changed. The French flyer, Louis Canot, opened fire on a German plane with a machine gun. Canot recorded history's first air-to-air -air kill. By early 1915, the Germans began sending their planes out in packs of four to ambush lone Allied pilots. In response, Britain's Royal Flying Corps issued a landmark order Reconnaissance aircraft are at all times to be escorted by three combat aircraft, flying in close formation. It was the dawn of the dogfight. 
a new hero appeared in the skies over Europe, the Ace. In 1916, the German Ace Oswald Bölke wrote the book on air combat. The principles he outlined still ring true. Secure all possible advantage before attacking. If you initiate an attack, follow it through. Fire only at close range. Keep your eye on your opponent. Attack your opponent from behind. If your opponent dives to attack you, turn to meet him. Always remember your line of retreat. Fight in groups of four to six and avoid several aircraft attacking the same target. Bulka met his fate after colliding with another German plane as they both dove for the same target. He died ignoring his own advice. Within a generation, the fighter made a quantum leap forward. Time itself changed. In World War I, two enemies who were two miles apart met in half a minute. In World War II, it was 10 seconds. At the outbreak of the war, the Germans ruled the skies with their swift Messerschmitt. Until it came up against the English Spitfire. The Japanese Zero met its match in the American P-38 Lightning. As one side gained the upper hand with machines, the other compensated with maneuvers, like the barrel roll and the yo-yo. The barrel roll was used against an enemy that could turn more easily. The attacker would simply turn the other way, then roll toward his target. The yo-yo kept an attacker from overshooting his target. When the enemy turned, the attacker simply pulled up, rolled slightly, and dove for the kill. By the Vietnam War, the lessons of dogfighting were 50 years old, but no one was teaching them. I'd seen 11 months of that war and saw that what they were training us for was not what was going on on the other side of the pond. We were cast in a war that, whether we liked it or not, there was a lot of fighting and not much winning. But America's losing streak was about to come to an end. Early in 1968, all hell broke loose in Vietnam. The North Vietnamese launched their greatest attack of the war, the Tet Offensive. They struck a hundred cities throughout South Vietnam and fought in the very streets of Saigon. By the end of the Tet Offensive, most Americans wanted to end the war. To help bring North Vietnam to the peace table, the Pentagon ordered its pilots not to fire unless fired upon. For the Navy, the order was a welcome reprieve. Its fighters were dropping like flies. In May, as Tet was winding down, five Navy Phantoms jumped two MiG-21s. The Phantoms launched three Sparrows without a hit. Although outnumbered, the MiGs managed to shoot down a Phantom. The Americans ejected to safety. The next encounter wouldn't be so lucky. 
The following month, a phantom from the USS America was shot down. One crewman was killed. The other became a POW. It became apparent that the thing that we had considered to be the number one threat in Vietnam, namely anti-aircraft fire, was being supplanted by fighter kills. Captain Frank Alt, skipper of the carrier Coral Sea, knew just how bad things were. In two years, his pilots had failed to shoot down a single MiG. Alt also knew what was wrong. I decided that what we needed was what I euphemistically call the womb-to-tomb approach. Let's look at this system, not just the weapon, not just the airplane, but the whole system, the pilot, the airplane, the weapon, womb-to-tomb, from the day it's conceived, it goes on the drawing board of the industry, until finally we send it back for overhaul. After firing off one memo after another, Alt was summoned by two admirals to explain himself. When I was called in in March of, of 68, I thought, not knowing what was the purpose of the meeting, that I was being called in to be given hell for uh, rocking the boat. And uh, I was quick to bolster my case for all of my arguments and found I'd stepped right into the hole these guys had dug for me, which was, if you know so much about it, why don't you go out there and solve the problem? Alt made 242 recommendations to solve the problem. His findings became known as the Alt Report. One of the worst problems was the treatment of the Phantom's missiles. A highly technical 20th century weapon was being manhandled like a medieval cannonball. What happened to it got the aircraft carrier was pretty horrifying. For example, the great American sailor uh, figured that the wings of the missile were to knock the tail fins in place. And we got shiploads of missiles which were damaged merely by physical handling. They found out that, that sparrows and sidewinders were put on aircraft and they come into uh, 25 to 50 landings at a time before they're taken off the airplane and even even taken down to the shop to analyze and two or three landings you know it's enough to bang or jar loose uh, uh, the electronics capability in the sparrows or the sidewinders to negate its capability of firing even if the missiles weren't duds pilots weren't always prepared to fire them we had pilots that were uh, trying to fire missiles and their armament switches were not armed. Most of all, pilots weren't trained for the kind of close quarters fighting they ran into in Vietnam. The solution lay in the most important recommendation in the Alt Report a new school for Navy pilots. We had to have it. I mean, it's a totally different deal. It wasn't something that we built, oh boy, we're going to train, we're going to change something here. And boy, put the big feather in our hat. That wasn't it. We had to do it because too many people were dying. We couldn't lose another friend. We were dealing in human life. This had a sense of urgency beyond anything I've ever done in my life. When the Alt Report was issued, Dan Pedersen was training rookie pilots at Miramar Naval Air Station in San Diego. The job of forming this new school fell into his lap. A fellow named Sam Leeds, who was a contemporary of mine in the squadron, came to me and he said, I got something to show you. And he gave me the Alt Report and I read it. And he said, how would you like to take charge and put together 
the graduate school that's defined in here. Pedersen had flown with some of the Navy's best pilots. From them, he handpicked his instructors. One was the pilot who made the first MiG kill of the war, J.C. Smith. We sat down and looked at that report, and he said, let's develop some tactics or a school. Let's get it built where we can change this around and save lives. Pilots would go back to basics to relearn lessons from the heyday of dogfighting. But Pedersen had no airplanes, no budget, no textbook. He didn't even have a classroom. But he had an ace in the hole named Steve Smith. Come to a point, I thought, Steve, go find a place for the school to set up offices and a ready room to teach out of and get us going. He came back about an hour later and he said, the base is full, there's nothing. You know, Steve was the kind of guy, I, it's a true story, I said, I know where there are some double wide trailers. Not the modern ones, but an old government double wide trailer. And I said, I want it over here. And he said, is Saturday okay? As it turned out, it took me, uh, I think, two cases of beer and a Saturday. And by Monday morning, the building was there and there was a guy painting it for us. From an old trailer and a few gallons of paint arose a new school of air combat. Top Gun. 1969, Top Gun was a Quonset hut. Top Gun was half a dozen small tables and chairs. Top Gun was, was crews coming into the school full of enthusiasm, full of passion. It was instructors of the same age or younger, full of that same passion, that same enthusiasm, and one other element, which was combat experience. Patterson and his instructors were flying by the seat of their pants. They had only three months to figure out what their pilots needed to know and how to teach it. One of the toughest jobs was simply attracting students to a school that hadn't proven its worth. We had to go around and talk to the squadron COs. And we said, okay. What we want, though, we want you to send your airplane. We don't have any airplane. We want you to send your maintenance crew to keep these airplanes turning and your best young pilots. They frequently weren't thrilled about participating in that. So I would have to have, suggest that they would call their air wing commander and he would explain to them why they really wanted to do what I was asking them to do. Welcome to the best five weeks of your flying career. When class began at Top Gun, the first lesson was the oldest rule in the book, know your enemy. We went back and we reviewed all the encounters. Uh, our intelligence officer reviewed all the encounters that had been made to date in, uh, in Vietnam. And we looked at what the MiGs had done. And we started flying that way. When Top Gun got its hands on a captured MiG-17, the instructors could not only tell their students how deadly it was, they could show them. It was a sobering sight. To a man, the people that came up and flew against it the first hop, everybody said, I've never seen an airplane turn like that in my life. Better they should see that in the western United States than over Hanoi. In the Nevada skies, students and instructors alike made a startling discovery. The MiG had a blind spot. Its pilot couldn't see what was under his own nose because the MiG's jet intake was so large. It gave us a real appreciation for the reliability, what we were up against. The fact, in real life, when I could look over in an instant, literally an instant, say, he can't see me. And I knew 
immediately said, he can't see me. Ron McEwen would remember this lesson from the Nevada desert. One afternoon in the skies over Vietnam. The first class to enroll in Top Gun learned a crucial lesson about their plane. The Phantom wasn't being outgunned. It was being outmaneuvered. Your first line of defense is to is to put your airplane in position where he can't shoot you. Your second line of defense is to put your airplane in position where you can shoot him. The trick with an F-4 is you might be able to get behind somebody, but you have to get far enough behind him so that you have range to use your missiles. And if you're too far behind him, he'll be able to turn so that you're not behind him anymore. In the skies of Nevada, Top Gun pilots learned the MiG could turn faster than the Phantom. But the Phantom could climb faster than the MiG and keep climbing until the pilots circled over and came up behind the MiG. Top Gun devised a tactic to exploit the Phantom's strength and the MiG's weakness. It was as simple as the egg. Your fighting ground is shaped like an egg. You go up into the vertical, you come back over, you can get nose tail, you just don't get slow with this MiG. We knew we could outclimb him, so take advantage of what, what you got. To their new discovery about the MiG, Top Gun added an old lesson from the days of dogfighting. Fight in pairs. Loose deuce formation, as we call it two airplanes flying side by side. You can maneuver out of that formation in place or you can cross turn. There are a lot of things you can do. We didn't develop that. That had been done before. Uh, if you were an adversary trying to attack this body, you, as you approached, you had to rapidly pick one or the other. Well, once you committed to one, you became vulnerable to the other. So now we begin to work in unison. And one may actually be set himself up to be a target and as the adversary would attack him, the other would roll in and um, take advantage of that situation. It's like boxing. It's one of the fighters kept the pressure on him and kept him turning horizontally down in the bottom of the egg while the other guy's up in the vertical top of the egg watching the fight. And we just take turns, go in and make a pass on him, try and shoot him. In April 1969, after five weeks of intense training, nine pilots graduated from the first class of Top Gun. The first test of our real success was the reaction of the, the air crews that came through, the first four teams that came through. They were enthusiastic. The bottom line question is, did you learn more? What did you learn and was it good? Was it good enough? He said, just learn to fly the airplane like this is good enough. The rest of it will come. Over in Vietnam, no one knew whether Top Gun had passed the test. The Navy was keeping pilots on a short leash as the peace talks dragged on. A year went by, and dozens of Top Gun graduates waited to prove themselves. There were no engagements, and so there was no real litmus test of, of whether the graduates were doing, doing well or not. Then, on March 28, 1970, the test came. Lieutenant Jerry Bollier and his wingman were on patrol over North Vietnam when Bollier suddenly spotted two gleaming dots in the sunlight. MiGs. Bollier's wingman took off after one MiG. Bollier dove for the other and began the egg maneuver. The MiG fired. The shot went wild. The MiG tried to shake Bollier, 
but he kept circling in the egg. Now he was looking down the MiG's tailpipe. The next shot finished the MiG off. Jerry Bollier was a graduate of the first class of Top Gun. And the first message that came out when he got his MiG was right back to Top Gun and to the rest of the Navy giving fighter weapons school credit for his MiG. He didn't even take credit for it himself and I've never met a fighter pilot that gave anybody else credit for anything. Was Top Gun truly a good school? Was Jerry Boulier simply a great pilot? Or was North Vietnam just having a bad day? The years dragged by. And the war dragged on. Then, in December 1971, the peace talks deadlocked. To break the impasse, America resumed the bombing. April 15, 1972. Muggs McEwen takes off to protect a squadron of bombers. In minutes, his radar intercept officer picks up a report. Bandits. We had no more crossed the coast, and we got a vector for bandits at uh, bullet flight. Uh, this is Oswald, vector 278, 75 miles for bandits. Well, Bogies is unidentified bandit is confirmed hostile. So I said to my RO, I said, did he say bandits? I said, yeah, he said bandits. Ask him again, Jack. I don't think he said bandits. And so Jack said, confirm bandits. He said, I confirm bandits. Well, this is it. The, the moment of your lifetime, the defining moment of, of a fighter pilot saying, this is it. And you're saying, here it is at 6 o'clock in the afternoon, we're going west, we're going to be looking into the sun, we're going into right downtown close to Hanoi. But it's better than no fight at all. And we kept taking the vectors from the, the controller, steering us uh, toward the, the bandits. And uh, finally about uh, oh, 10 or 12 miles away, I finally started picking up a, a contact. Right then, Mug spots the MiGs. Muggs called out to uh, Tally Ho uh, on the nose, you know, six, eight miles, something like that. And he saw the, the glint off of uh, the wings, and they came right down between us. And we, we damn near had a midair with uh, one of the, uh, the 17s. It just canopy to canopy. And Jack said, oh my God, it's raining. And I looked up and they had four MiG-17s raining us. All of a sudden there was one that uh, Jack said, 4.30 and he's gunning, do your pilot stuff. And I looked up and sure enough, there was a guy at uh, about 4.30, he was shooting. And uh, I could see the tracers going by. Muggs turned very hard into the MiG to try to break his tracking solution. And the MiG-17 had a much better turning radius than the F-4. And this guy just turned his nose up like this and just, as we were turning, he just kept turning inside of us like that. The MiG now made a fatal mistake. As his nose turned, the Phantom disappeared right into the blind spot Ron McEwen discovered at Top Gun. I looked up and said, he can't see me from there. I know very, I know good and well. McEwen hit the brakes. That was all it took. I came out of burner and pushed forward stick and just flew by out in front of me and shot him. At that instant, another MiG was hot on the tail of their wingman. And so I maneuvered him around and then came around and shot the other one off at six o'clock. The battle still wasn't over. Yet another MiG was closing in on Muggs and Jack. This one back here at 8 o'clock has uh, become a threat, and I'm calling for him to do some 
do some of that pilot stuff up there because, you know, we've got a guy back here uh, at our 8 o'clock, so he comes back and looks like that, and he uh, agreed with my assessment of it that, yes, this guy was a threat. Using the egg maneuver he learned at Top Gun, Ron went into a steep climb and circled behind the MiG. The MiG fled for home. I'm sure he went back to the bar that night and said, I don't know about you guys, but I fought King Kong. Outnumbered three to one. The Phantom scored two kills in one day. After years of failure, the Navy finally had cause to rejoice. Top Gun at last had proof its lessons worked. But even greater proof was yet to come. Early morning, April 22nd, 1972. The waning days of the Vietnam War. In the Gulf of Tonkin, Two warplanes take off from the USS Hancock to protect bombers striking the Mekong Delta. Suddenly, the Hancock's air traffic controller picks up enemy planes and vectors the Phantoms for an intercept. In minutes, Lieutenant Jerry Tucker spots a low-flying MiG-17. In a flawless example of the egg maneuver, Tucker pulls up into a steep climb and rolls in behind the MiG. The MiG is a sitting duck. Then, the unprecedented happens. The MiG pilot ejects. He'd rather lose his plane than lose his life. The MiG's adversary was a graduate of Top Gun. Frank Alt, the man who rocked the Navy's boat, had gambled on Top Gun and won. I had no trouble at all buying the idea that uh, this was the way to go. The greatest converts were the commanders who once fought sending their best pilots to an untested school. I saw what they learned and what they could teach the rest of the people in the squadron. I don't think a single one didn't come back and say thank you. You, you did a heck of a job for us. As encounters between MiGs and Phantoms rose, Navy kills soared. I think 32 aircraft were shot down, and, and 30 of those were shot down by graduates of the school. Among these were kills by aces Randy Cunningham and Willie Driscoll, both graduates of the first Top Gun class. Of their five kills, three came on a single day. One of the real values of Top Gun is, is their ability to take the, the air crew that they train and get them prepared in such a way that when they walk out the door, they have this real sense in their heart that no matter what, and we mean no matter what, and, and I'm talking about life or death hanging in the balance, they can do it. After I went through uh, Top Gun, I never thought that I was going to go up and lose, that it gave you the confidence that no matter who you met, that your training was going to carry you through the day. Willie and I wouldn't be alive today if it hadn't been for Top Gun. Once we sent Top Gun graduates back to Vietnam, they did very, very well. And the ratio changed from 2 to 1 to 13 to 1. We were able to show in combat where it really mattered, not just studies and classrooms. We were able to take the ALT report, turn it into instructors that put people out the front door that dramatically improved the kill ratios in air-to-air -air combat in Vietnam. 
if you say, was it worth it, did we do the job? The kill ratio at the end of the war ended up 12 to 1. In the latter 14 months of the eight-year Vietnam War, we had a kill ratio, the Navy had a kill ratio of over 21 to 1. That speaks for itself. What began as a seat of the pants crash course has developed into the world's best air combat school. But lessons are always in danger of being forgotten. It's been as long since Vietnam as it was between World War I and World War II. We have aviators who have spent an entire career and never been shot at. I'm not going to make a judgment, but you know, historically, we'll relearn again uh, things that we've forgotten. It's going to take innovative, foresighting thinking and people continually reminding us that when it comes down to war, sooner or later, airplanes are going to look at airplanes in the air and they're going to have to shoot each other down. The greatest lesson Top Gun taught was that the machine could never replace the man. Roger that. It's much more attractive to say we have an I got you weapon that says I got you and the guy blows up. But <laughs> we still have never developed that machine. We don't have that type of doomsday machine and I don't believe we ever will. The same tactics that we learned from, from the earlier air engagements in, in history are still germane. They will win again. It is never the machine, it's the man. <laughs>